Man, wow. So we're doing something a little different this week. In the same room. In the same room. Hanging out like old show days. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Backstage. Only no. only difference between this and old show days was I still wouldn't be able to see you in old show days. You'd be like, Right, oh, right. Baby. I'd be over sitting in yeah. you know, looking in my world versus, you know, we're actually in the same room hanging out. And it does feel weird just standing here looking making eye contact with each other the whole time. It is a little weird, dude. <laughs> but I like it. It's All different. Right. Cool, man. So, dude, like like we said, it's like old show days. We're hanging out. I'm on a gig in Orlando. You came through, hanging out, talking about business mm -hmm. after hours. And let's talk about Stephen Bowles. Oh, no. <laughs> hey, we talked about everybody else. We talked about me on episode zero. That's so, true. So we let's talk about you. you. Let's talk about your start. Oh, no. I'm sorry. How do you say so tell us, how the heck did you find <laughs> this that's world that we like? call production? <laughs> I know, I always say the same way. You do. I? <laughs> I mean, that, hey, that's the way to kick it off. Yeah. So how did you get here? Um, I think accidentally is probably the best way to say it. I was supposed to do film at mm -hmm. UCF Film School here in Orlando, Florida, actually. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. Uh, they like didn't accept me at the last second. <laughs> I was all set to go in there, and I'm uh, you Wait, know, the last second. What do you mean the last second? Well, like I got accepted into the film school out of I don't know. 2000, you got accepted. Yeah, two thousand applicants down to only like twenty students that they'd take in, uh -huh. and uh, they said I got accepted, and so I just didn't apply to any other colleges at all. This was back in two thousand and three, wow. and uh, by the time I got to summer. I got a notice from UCF saying, while the film school accepted me, uh -huh. the school itself didn't accept me because my GPA was too low, which was like a 3.3 three or something like that. Well, well, I know, right? <laughs> Ridiculous. Yeah, I don't, even, I don't even understand. I can't even comprehend how the film school can accept you without the university accepting you. It didn't make sense to me either, and I, and I fought wow. it as long as I could, and, yeah. uh, and I actually lost. I, I, I kept saying to myself, if the sports team had accepted, right? If I had made the varsity <laughs> right. basketball team. I, I was already a top recruit. Right, I was in top film, recruit. In film. But film apparently doesn't uh, hold it the doesn't same It doesn't hold the same standards as an athletic student. Athletic student. Yeah, so wow. uh, I ended up uh, doing Valencia Community College here, and then, uh, but really the big thing that happened yes. was I met uh, this guy, Neil Morrison, mm. uh, works over at OMG right now, mm -hmm. and fantastic guy, mm -hmm. and he basically said, Come work with me and I'll save you a whole education. You know, I'll wow. save you four years of education and eighty thousand dollars. And so wow. I went and worked with him at a church here in Orlando called Northland Church. Yeah. And uh it was sort of a mega church level and um really got just exposed to the live side. Right. Yeah. So before this I was always telling stories. I was doing like James Bond movies, you know, like on VHS <laughs> uh with my brothers. I'd film I probably filmed four James Bond movies. Were you movies. James? I was not James. No, I'm, oh, okay, I'm the director. Okay. I would be the standard <laughs> extra. Thank you for clarifying. I, no, I'm not James. <laughs> There's always my my younger brother was James. Bond. Okay. I was always either an extra or the director. Okay. But, um, yeah. I I mean, then and then throughout high school, I just made movies, and so yeah. I I actually started my like kind of creative side entirely more in the um, post production. Right. Mm -hmm. I'd go shoot something, and then I'd edit it together mm -hmm. in this really epic way, mm -hmm. and uh, I loved that. I loved everything about that. Um, I love telling stories through, you know, visuals and audio and yeah. all that kind of stuff. And so live didn't make sense to me. I didn't really know what that meant. And, uh, but Neil with this church, they just put on these massive shows every single weekend. Um, and one of the roles I got to start learning was how to, you know, direct cameras mm. uh, for the live screen. And so anyway, spent a couple of years there. It was very fruitful, just a strong blessing, but inevitably, you know, moved out into yeah, more of the right, market, right? right? And went and worked for this company up in Alabama that did tours um, and some integrations, but tours for country. Which what year? I, is, what, we, what year are we talking? This is oh uh, four oh five, I think. Okay. And so okay, I'm up there, and uh, they did like Montgomery Gentry, um, Brooks and Dunn, uh -huh. and I'd be an assist director on those tours. And then in addition to that, I just learned how to do AV integration. Yeah. Right? Learned signal well, path. Learned what all is that a, kind of stuff. 
what is an AD? I'm sorry to we're gonna go back to what's that? What, what is an AD? What is an assistant director? What does that job consist of? Well, with an assistant director, particularly in music, you're counting uh, for time okay. um, for dur- during music, you know. Uh, so this is like verse one, verse two, okay. and you're sort of time people into a particular thing. And then the live director is sort of um, hearing that and then calling his show as he sees it right there. And then also I was just kind of relief directing. So these yeah, guys would be right. on tour. Yeah. They're doing the same show week in, week yeah. out. And so they'd be done you know and i'd come get to do it for a couple of days and okay stuff. so yeah right. it was great it, it basically moved me from the worship market more into the you know creative kind of secular yeah market. yeah um and then but, really but yeah at, at the worship you have praise and worship yeah oh i, I mean that I, that's where i really honed kinda... in my skill set yeah. for directing music okay which was my inevitably my strength mm-hmm. uh through my directing career has always been music um i hear it in my mind and i see the story uh very clearly yeah. like how i want that to be expressed to people and i'm uh specific about it like i have my version and that's the fun thing about live directing is everybody has um you put five directors next to each other they're not going to cut it all the same way no they're not right you know and uh they might generally hit the major checkpoints you know um but there's a lot of shots that uh, are between the major shots that are kind of minors, if you want to think about that, that are up to the director's discretion. And no one's even paying attention except for him. And uh, the ability to own that is 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 pretty important. It's kind of like we were, you and I were talking about actually before this mm-hmm. interview right now. Um, we were talking about more of like directing as a craft, right? As an yes. art craft. Yes. And, you know, you got your brush stroke. And it's, it is pretty cool because you're basically in your mind seeing a story you have all these influences coming at you, right? So in your head, you're like, I've heard this song, you know, a hundred times. I know how Dave Matthews, right? I got to direct Dave Matthews, mm-hmm. one of my favorite bands. It was like a life point for me, life checkbox for me. Yeah. And so I directed Dave Matthews and I remember like, I know these songs in my head and I know what I want them to look like, but doesn't, regardless of that, in the moment, I've got camera guys yeah. selling me shots. Yeah. And so I'm actively redefining oh the story in yeah. the moment because I got what I want to accomplish, but then I've also got what's available to me, right? What are they actually Giving selling you. me on? Right. And then I have to re sort of string it together right there in the moment. How it's, how often has it happened where it's like, no, that's not what I see in my head. No, that's not the shot that I want. Well, you, me- <laughs> well you mean when a camera guy like whip Pam's left? Or right? uh, that's like one of my, like, I think it's that's just not it. It's a healthy dosage of reality check that has to come to a, a, yeah. a live like director because we, you know, call camera one, mm-hmm. hit, take it live. And then what? Like we have to move on. Even though it's right. still live on program, yes, we, we have, have to, to move on next... and be working on the next five or six shots yes, ahead. Yeah. And so every once in a while, we get that like gut check, that kick in the balls where the camera guy <laughs> doesn't remember that he's live and he just whips left. Yep. Check and your you tally. have to, it basically like takes your tower of cards and just, oh, you know, they all But then you got to pick yourself back up. Okay, right back now, up it doesn't bother me. Go. Move on to the next. Oh, and that's the beauty about live TV and live in general is yeah. even though, it, you know, if it's a big one, the audience will see it. Um, they move right on by it, you know, mm-hmm. whereas film directing, uh, you know, that's recorded mm-hmm. forever. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. there's those famous shots in The Shining with Jack uh, Nicholson. Nicholson, yeah, where one shot, he's got an axe and another wait, is it shot, Nicholson he or does Nicholas? It. Jack Nicholas. Nicholas. One of those guys Jack- died. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is. Nicholson, wait. The dude from The Shining. Oh, man. Uh, wow. Yes. The dude from The Shining. The dude from The Shining. Either way, let's go. <laughs> he, uh, yeah. In one shot, he's got the axe. In the other shot, he doesn't, right? Yeah. So that's just, that was then the final cut. There's no getting away from that. Yeah. Whereas with live, that basically just disappears, right? No mm-hmm. one sees it ever right. again. Because no one's Hopefully re-watching forgot, live right. television typically. Yeah. 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 Definitely not now. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> with TiVo and everything or DVRs. Man. Okay. So we tr- we are doing concerts assistant directing and it helped you to understand signal flow because mm, you didn't mention that i did mention you that. signal flow and just the whole building the production instead of just the production constantly staying in one venue yeah well what i got to do is we do installations for integrations yeah. with churches broadcast studios whatever and that was nice because you get the whole picture right mm-hmm. you've got to um with live you load it in 
you kind of just throw the cable on the ground, general organization, but mm -hmm. it is what it is. And then you get it out. With installation, you have to be very, very intentional all the time because you have to measure your distances. Yes. You have to run it in the walls. Yes. You have to um, know what you're, how many spigots on your DA you're using because you don't just have 50 DAs in a drawer, mm -hmm. you know, waiting for you. Mm -hmm. You have the one that you're selling to the customer. You know, like they're buying the one and it's going to be there for the next four years. Yeah. And so anyways, just getting that comprehensive view took me from just being someone who enjoyed directing cameras to someone who understood the whole, what makes it all up. Right. And, uh, I think that that's something that, that did shift my career quite a bit because I, I meet a lot of live directors mm -hmm. who are disconnected from the production, you know, technically and the mm -hmm. mechanics of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. they're typically, you know, more Hollywoody, mm -hmm. uh, they get more more in their own world. Yeah, and not thinking about what everybody's doing for me to do my part. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they yeah. walk in and they they feel like they were the they're they're a talent on some level, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, and everything that has happened the three days of loading before doesn't really matter to them, mm -hmm. you know. Now that they're here, the show gets started, mm -hmm. um, and so for me having the visibility into what makes up, you know, the entire production process, I think helped ground me a little bit more to be, you know, when I really moved and then that was what I did next. I went and worked with LMG uh, down in Orlando, Florida, and was really a, you know, uh, a show tech slash video director. Mm -hmm. um, and even though I, I don't think I did maybe two out of 2000 shows with them that I didn't call cameras, uh, I still loaded in the whole gig yeah. and I still was on the video team and I set up video village, you know, yeah. and I went out and if the projection guys were behind, I'm working with them, yeah. you know, Clem, I'm carrying your butt when you're slow or whatever. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> no, no that didn't happen. <laughs> this is back before Klimco did. No, just back before Klimco. Yeah. AV man. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Long time ago. Tell us about that first day. The uh, very first day with on, LMG. With LMG, the basically with LMG, I knew uh, gear and I knew craft, but I didn't know how this live corporate meetings and just sort of events uh, space mm -hmm. worked. Right, and LMG even has their own particular way that they do it. And so I walked in on this first gig essentially, and. Uh, it was a small breakout room. I ain't never done anything like that. <laughs> I've, I've never even done a live general session. I've only done concerts yeah. or church. You yeah. Know? So this and were general... you running the cables on those? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But on this okay. main on this main general session, uh, I'm not even in there. I'm in the small breakout room down the hall, and they've got a Screen Pro switcher or something like mm -hmm. that. And I'm the one who's trying to i'm the lead tech but i don't know anything right and so i'm trying to set up this screen pro switcher at the front of the stage at the base of the steps and i think it was like drew bro i think i told the story yeah yeah, yeah yeah so drew did, bro did, basically said hey i don't know who you are but i don't <laughs> think you have a clue what you're doing right shout now. out to drew bro right great guy He's great a good tech dude. you know somebody who knows his craft yeah he does. yeah but he was like but clearly, you didn't know your craft. Oh, I didn't know in anything. that situation. I didn't know anything. <laughs> what it was is I, I knew I knew what I needed to hook up. I just didn't know how this world set it up. Yeah, you know, because yeah, every yeah, world yeah. is a little different. Yeah. And that's the big thing I've learned from Showflow, and we'll talk about that in a second. But mm -hmm. with Showflow, I've gotten exposure to even more of the different verticals and sectors inside of production. Mm. Right? You know, I've experienced personally concerts, rock and roll um corporate events yes. and sort of traditional yep. meetings yep. and then house of worship but there's so many more out there there's theater mm. there's professional sports mm. you know a lot about that yeah. one yep. there's yep. collegiate um there's broadcast mm -hmm. right there's all these different ones and they're all using a bnc right or an, yeah. an xlr on yeah. some level yeah. but the way that they approach it for that venue or for that audience or for that um, group of people that are mm -hmm. coming together that day is entirely different it, from it, one to the other. So it's funny because I'm going to get all, I get all woo woo and metaphorical sometimes. You're the most uh, squishy person I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> is that a compliment? I, I think know. it's a compliment. You're know. the tall squishy but, guy. But I was, I had to write an intro. I'm speaking um, at a university or a college. I'm speaking at a college 
to the class and just telling them about our industry and opportunities. And I had to write an intro for myself and thinking about how, and I thought about all the different, similar to you, yeah. all the different parts of this live events world mm -hmm. that I've been a part of. And it, as we're talking about show flow, by you being a part of all of those different facets of live event, you understand that there's different ways that they may do things as far as hooking things up and setting up, but essentially they all need to communicate with oh, one sure. another. Yeah. And every department needs to work together to get the project done. And that seems like that seems to be what Showflow does. It helps people to learn how to communicate with one another. It does in a well, more efficient way. Yeah, I mean, it, show flow is about bringing the entire workflow mm -hmm. and its chaotic, um, messy self, yeah, and bringing it into a place to where you can have some level of standardization inside of it. Mm -hmm. um, I started show flow back in 2012, and it was um, I was on a merch show. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Shout out to Joe Mertz. Joe Mertz, good man. And I'm on a on a merch show down in uh, Naples. Naples. Yep. Yeah, and I know yeah, I've shared yeah. some of this. I'll do short. But basically, I was backstage, and Liesel or Julie or one of them <laughs> yeah. comes around dropping off another version of the rundown, right, of the show flow. What and version I, are we on now? I know exactly. It's like <laughs> uh, you know, and I had just gotten done making all my private notes, mm -hmm. you know, making all my highlights and all that stuff, and I got my six page document. And they drop a new one. And so, you know, you have to sit there in that moment and make that decision. Am I going to transfer this information from one version to the other, right? Mm -hmm. Which is just tedious work. Mm -hmm. Or am I going to not take the newest version and see if I can make uh, this sort of assessment on whether or not there's any significant changes? Right. And that is something that um, honestly should never have been put in my my face i should never have had that as a choice mm -hmm. i should always have the latest information mm -hmm. right that shouldn't be something that is uh i have to decide hmm, do i want to right. know the most is something else going to come right. along i wonder if they've this... added a video role <laughs> after this moment. i shouldn't wonder that that yeah. should just be a given yeah. and i should be able to have that information on hand and that should be available relatively at ease and it just isn't in that workflow and that's just me on the receiving end if you actually talk to the production companies they're the ones that are creating these I, was, I did a demo so we do mm -hmm. software demonstrations for show flow all the time i was on a demo the other day and they were, we were talking to a brand new production company and they were sort of relating with the problem that we solved and they said Stephen, we've been on our 46th version of a production schedule and we're still two weeks out from show so like wow. right there wow. there is just pain right i just want yeah. to say it that like that shouldn't be uh but it is and the reason is is because w our entire job as an industry is to build an ongoing breathing experience all that goes all the way up until the day of the event mm -hmm. so the speaker hits the stage there is a potential for change because that's mm -hmm. what we're doing we're doing a live show right we're doing a live production on some level or another and so there's always these influencing factors that want to say should we move the video before or after you know yes. steve jobs hits the stage <laughs> do i want to go imac across all screens or just isolate it to one mm -hmm. like those decisions while you can put one down in print 10 days out from show it's all up for change all the way until the very last moment and the fact that we were using excel as the workflow and version saving and then printing, that is just a broken yeah. workflow. It doesn't yeah. match the actual demand that the industry puts mm -hmm. on our on our production teams. And so that's why I built Showflow. So in a nutshell, just so anyone who's new, Showflow is a software platform for production teams to create rundowns, production schedules, um, all in real time. You can create different events. They're essentially like projects. Uh, you can invite your crew directly to the one event, uh, give them different editing permissions so that different people can make different edits. That's the one really like key advantage for um, production crews like Clem and myself is mm -hmm. that we could be invited into an event, right? Our clients will invite their AV team into the event and then give Clem editing permission of his column. Right. So then all of a sudden the video column or the projection column or for him, you know, video during show, it's going to be playback. Mm -hmm. You can actually get in there and make some notes. Right. As opposed to the producer just saying, hey, it's coming off a of DDRA. 
you can amend that and actually put the exact file name in mm-hmm. there. The Whatever exact... information that I deem important, that's exactly I right. could put that under my notes area. And so so as a whole, that's that's what we're doing. We're just we're allowing teams to collaboratively work on these key documents, which essentially comes down to production rundowns and schedules. Yeah. Um so outside of that, there's a bunch of features we've been talking about, but that's sort of the core reason for it. And uh to what you were saying, seeing the problem roll across so many different industries, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Professional sports. Yes huge they're all working every single day all week up until their game day mm-hmm. Orlando magic the rams the cubs are all using shuffle so then you've also got corporate events mm-hmm. right so you got larger events that are like Drury's with ibms you've got tek's you've got things like that mm-hmm. and then of course you've got house of worship mm-hmm. but then you've got more you've also got broadcast yes you've got live shows like ufc yes because that's all live Oh my goodness, absolutely. And they're all, we get on calls with these guys all the time, these production teams, and it all starts with the same thing. What do you use? Mm -hmm. Excel. I mean, like everyone is doing it. Everyone uses Excel and they just didn't have a choice. And uh, anyway, I don't know where we started, but more so just (laughs) know. We were talking about the communication, the availability to communicate with your coworkers during this event and get the schedule any more efficient environmental friendly way well and check this out here's the other thing yeah um i went to i went and did a a speaking on this uh was with this event Uh, i don't want to mention it but basically this this group of event professionals that got together and wanted to talk about sort of what's what's up and coming and here is one of the way i mentioned it to them i go listen uh we have moved in the production world right it used to be the coliseum was the hot hot thing Mm -hmm. right and this is a venue built for amplification of your sound and your voice right um now we have line arrays Mm -hmm. okay so there's been a lot of evolution there Mm -hmm. uh same thing uh with speaking it used to be using flags back in the day Mm -hmm. for theater to communicate hey cue the spotlight to turn on or not now we have headsets and calm you know now we even have readle systems where you can talk internationally on on events um I think that while certainly we've had advances in communication workflow, I think we're still way behind. Yeah. You know, I think if anything, the newer technologies like Dropbox and Box and uh, the newer uh, sort of software mechanisms like uh, group chats or text messages um, have almost just messied it up even more. One of the last shows I did, and I don't do shows quite as much anymore now that Showflow has really done well, but uh, one of the last shows I did was with Chris Drury. Mm-hmm. And I'm shouting out to him because I love Chris. I love Drury team. They've been amazing, big supporters of Showflow. Um, but I was directing cameras for one of his large IBM shows yep. out there in um, in Vegas, and he's texting me during the show, uh-huh. uh, suggesting different, you know, camera direction. Uh, not because it wasn't working, but more of just like, hey, think about doing some of this stuff. Yeah. And I'm sitting there laughing because it was a so amazing that he had direct access to me. But be so interesting that um, that he had direct access to me like that, and it completely bypassed yeah. the entire production workflow that we just spent six days rehearsing. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like we just did cue to cues and cue to cues and cue to cues, and none of them involved these last second suggested cue changes. Yeah. But now, because of that communication medium, he was able to get that to me, and I was able to deliver to him, which is great. But how could other how could Showflow and 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 sort of initiatives like Showflow help standardize that where Chris doesn't have to leave the already existing infrastructure or the software platforms that are built for this industry so that Alice Perminer or Andy Fagan, you know, those stage managers mm-hmm. aren't kept out of that loop. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? It does. It does make sense. You know, and it's a matter of just understanding that something needed to change that and that direct access to receive the change. You know, is what Showflow has done, but but all that being said, you know, you mentioned Chris, and you're talking about your live events. Do you miss that? You know, like that. You're you're wearing a completely different hat. You're not painting that same picture. Do you miss just the basic brush? Hmm. I do. I do, man. Yeah. I uh, I used to do. I mean, I used to gig all the time. That's where I met you and so many other people. So many amazing guys that I, you know, when I think about how Showflow impacts the industry, I think about you. I think about Phil Lacaris and mm-hmm. I think about Chris Rutowski's and Cameron Urys and, and these people that 
I slung AV cases around yeah. with for years. And um, I think that I take joy now in knowing that what I'm working on and what show flow offers to this industry is helpful. Mm -hmm. I, 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 and that's not even me just sort of assuming I, I talk with a lot of people and I'm hearing that while change is difficult, you know, and you got changing someone's behavior, yeah. right? We're not just changing one. Per I'm not just changing Clem's behavior. Mm -hmm. Show flow is set out every single day to change the behavior of an industry. Um, and that, <laughs> that takes effort, man. Yeah. Uh, that takes a lot of, um, uh, commitment in the vision of it right because otherwise if the first person ever used show flow if i just ran off of their opinion i'd never i wouldn't be doing it anymore right first person ever ran show flow said that's pretty cool but eh, i don't know yeah maybe but you know but it's but i don't know if you realize you've done this i asked you about directing and painting right and you started talking about show flow do you identify yourself now as show flow instead of stephen bowles the director that's an interesting question <laughs> I, uh, I definitely introduced because myself. I, you know we understand you know the impact that you're trying to make on the industry but yeah you know is that man uh i think that i i can only say what i know i do right now which is i i lead with show flow i introduce myself to people uh as you know the founder and ceo of show flow i don't and then i relate to with them yeah with my previous uh career as a live video director um, yeah. so i relate to them in that that's one of my favorite things to do is actually get production like a coordinator or a td or a project manager on the phone and then i'll start asking them questions we'll do software demos you know four yeah. or five of those a day with new customers and so i'll get them on the phone and i'll be talking about it and hearing tell tell me about your current workflow and i'll just start relating with them and st we'll start sharing mm -hmm. war stories mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so i think i I'll never not be a live video director, but I do believe that like where I am right now and what I wake up to do every day right now is to not go call cameras for iMag yeah. for a one-off event. I I go to the office and work with an amazing group of guys who sit in front of a whiteboard and write names like show caller and stage manager yeah. and video director and producer on the board and, and we're we're literally trying to uh, get their persona uh, or persona out off the whiteboard and play it through our scenarios and show flow so that our software is helpful. Otherwise, what are we doing? You know, yeah. like if I can't make a producer's life easier, um, then well, why am I doing that? We should, I should just go back and direct right. cameras. Right. Like, absolutely. So I, right. I guess that's a long answer to say I, I I I'm both, but I lead with show flow. But I I do it because of what I was, you know, and mm -hmm. what I feel and remember feeling as being a live video director. And 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 as you say that, because you you said something very powerful that I that I appreciate or it, that definitely caught my attention. You're trying to when you when your team, you and your team, okay, because oh, at first it wasn't just you. It was it's you and your team write the different positions on a oh, whiteboard absolutely. right and you said that you're trying to make their lives easier yeah man that's it you know you're trying to give back to them dude we want to help it's like yeah at you're, the end you're of the day trying we're to trying to help right oh absolutely and it's like not just help them for their mindset on show site because that eventually trickles down to the organization of the show before you even get on show site so there it makes their home work life more enjoyable and relaxing and it gives them opportunity to be more focused on yeah. their life or whatever they want to do at home one of the best things that i've ever felt and heard we do a lot of post event reviews yeah keith oberfield amazing guy uh kbo group out of michigan if you guys ever need any work call call keith and uh he i was he's been big advocate for show flow and we were doing a case study with him and I asked him, what's the big thing? Like, why at the end of the day, in a non-feature driven sort of <laughs> uh, explanation, why show flow is helping or not? Yeah. And he said the coolest thing. He goes, because I get to go to the bar at the end of the night. <laughs> like, literally yeah. for him to be able to go through his rehearsals mm -hmm. and his cue to cues. Mm -hmm. And as the changes come, he just makes them. Mm -hmm. And then everybody sees them. Mm -hmm. He then 
gets to like rehearse it or cue it again with the new change in written, like already applied. Yeah. He said at the end of the day, he used to with Excel go back to his hotel room and be working for another two or three hours by himself mm -hmm. on, on a show flow. Mm -hmm. And now he closes his lid when everybody else does. Yes. And he goes to the lobby yes. bar when everybody else does. And he gets to be do a little bit more life on these shows, yeah. which are already so gruesome yeah. most of the time anyways. He gets to be a person, a human right. being for a couple right. more hours. Not a night. part of the machine right. after hours. I know. Like we're part of the machine during hours. Yeah. But once we're cut for the day, yeah. we do get an opportunity to be human <laughs> well yeah you absolutely know? even what you and i are doing right now you're on a gig yeah. but you're up here at 8 p.m and yeah. you and i are able to spend some time having a drink and yeah. relating and talking about life and now and i can't imagine having to go through excel well yeah and continue to work while i know everybody else is chilling at harrods of whatever harrods city of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. totally yeah man but it's you know it's 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 beautiful you know once you break it down and uh and explain it like that because it's an opportunity to give back to people and realize that you too can have a life. Just, no matter what level you're on from a stagehand all the way up to the producer of the show, yeah. you too deserve a life when we're on show site. And this is an avenue for you to continue to enjoy the company of your coworkers. Well, and sometimes it takes a Facebook post where we see a friend who got hurt or well, God forbid, you know, passed away yeah, to yeah. like shake up reality because we just go from gig to gig to gig, mm -hmm. uh, ballroom to ballroom. Or <clears throat> if you're in TV production, sports production, you're just going from venue to venue. Mm -hmm. um, but there's so much more than the work. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm not even trying to paint show flow as the way to get your life back that's not what i'm trying <laughs> that's like way out Whoa, there too I'm, deep. I'm not there i'm not there yet yeah but i do think that um we already work so very hard yeah. and you know i like how you were saying earlier um there's the machine honestly there's the attendee who shows up at 8 a.m <laughs> for breakfast and his little yeah. morning gs we're there at six yeah but we were also there till 10 p.m the night before yeah. and so that's that's pretty much ridiculous to yeah. be honest. Uh, yeah. and that will, that will wear on anybody. Mm -hmm. Um, any way of lightening that up. And even if it's not changing the time or the hours, but changing the tone mm -hmm. while you're there where it's not, um, conflict driven or confusing because people have different sort of information sources or people are running off of different versions, God mm -hmm. forbid, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. The ability to, even if we just lighten the tone of the during the day rehearsals and show, because it's just a little easier knowing that everything's kind of there. If it's in show flow, I look at it, it's what it is. Right. You know? um, that would even make me happy if that's mm -hmm. kind of like the census that comes, you know, from from this industry experiencing show flow. Either way, dude, um, yeah, we have a team of 10 people that show up every single day and we just want to help. Yeah. And we work with uh, producers and coordinators every single day trying to identify what their problems are and move them over. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that makes me happy Yeah, right there to know that there's people working on that for, for this industry every day. Dude, I mean, I, I think we just leave it there. I don't even know where to go from there. I know. <laughs> And it was cool to to be here with you and yeah. hang out. Like I said, it felt like old times, man. It did. It did. So uh, I guess on that note, we're gonna wrap up this uh, this B channel side of uh, <laughs> the production <laughs> this channel. Was, this is a B channel. This is a B channel, definitely, like man. That. You know. So uh, tune in next week to see what uh, production channel has to offer. Peace. Appreciate it, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.